And for us, you know, the use of rituxan in combination has really been uh, where we've invested most of our time and efforts because whether you combine it with cyclophosphamide and regimens that I'm sure many of you know, such as CHOPR, CVPR, CPR, RCD, if you combine it with nucleoside analogs, drugs like fludarabine or cladribine, if you combine it with thalidomide, bortezomib, or now bendamustine, we get much higher response rates. But what we still don't have enough of are complete remissions. And if there's one point I want to stress to all of us who work in this disease is that these numbers have to improve, particularly if we're ever going to dream about curing this disease, but also, as I'll show you in a little bit, being able to keep our patients in the longest possible remissions. Now, there's also some inherent uh, problems that we've encountered as we've administered these different combinations. And I think it's important to recognize these because when you have all these choices, you know, how do you pick the right one for a particular patient? And one of the things that we came to discover along the way in which we reported in a very large publication in the journal JCO two years ago involving a study of over 400 Waldenstrom's patients is that the risk with nucleoside analog drugs like fludarabine or cladribine is real. And you see an increased risk of the disease transforming to a more aggressive lymphoma, but also the development of leukemia as well as a failure of the bone marrow called myelodysplasia. And so in this study, actually the rate was about 10% for disease conversion to an aggressive lymphoma and about 5% risk for developing leukemia or the pre-leukemic condition myelodysplasia. Now the other bump that we hit along the way in clinical trials that we were doing, we're looking at drugs that are called IMIDs. These are what we call immune modulatory based drugs. And in fact, Bob Kyle's institution here at the, uh, in uh, Minnesota has played a huge role in the development of these drugs for multiple myeloma. And there have been a number of groups uh, that have looked at this in Waldenstrom's. And the story is quite opposite. In myeloma, these drugs have been very successful. In Waldenstrom's, they have their own problems. Thalidomide can actually cause neuropathy, uh, as it does in myeloma, but much more so in Waldenstrom's patients. And lenalidomide can cause the hematocrit to drop quite abruptly. And in many uh, cases, it led to hospitalization of patients who were anemic and ended up with more profound uh, symptoms. So for this reason, this class of drugs has been minimized in the use uh, in Waldenstrom's patients. Now, proteasome inhibitors, on the other hand, have been quite successful, and, I, and, and they do have problems, and I want to kind of walk you through the proteasome inhibitors. And this is the drug class that would be represented by bortezomib or Velcade. And for starters, what is a proteasome inhibitor? Well, it's really a drug that blocks the waste disposal of cells. Now, sometimes, you don't want that waste disposal system to work. And this is the case with Waldenstrom's because if you're able to block the waste basket, you choke up the cells and they die. And this is exactly what happens. And I thought it was kind of fortuitous when I saw a waste management truck going by one day and I said, you know, that would make a nice slide. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about bortezomib, the waste bucket um, uh, blocker. Um, this is a drug that we have spent, as a field, quite a few years now looking at. It's been a very successful drug class for the treatment of myeloma patients. And in studies that have been done by a number of groups across the country as well as in Europe, what we've come to learn is that they can produce high response rates. Now, if you combine bortezomib or Velcade with dexamethasone and rituxan, response rates of 95% and almost a quarter of the patients actually get into a complete remission. And at last glance, uh, in Venice at the international workshop, um, the average time that the patients were being kept in remission well, was well in excess of four years. We still don't have an estimate as to how long these patients will stay in remission, but they're continuing to be in remission. But here's the speed bump. 30% of the patients ended up with neuropathy. For most of these patients, it was reversible. But if you're the one who's stuck with the neuropathy, you know, obviously it's a problem. And so it's important to keep this particular problem in mind. Even though most patients do reverse, the average time to reversal is about six months. And we do use Lyrica quite sparingly in these patients, and it's been of great benefit. Now, that's using a schedule where we give the bortezomib twice a week uh, for two weeks and then one week off. Now, Irene Gobriel at our institution thought, well, maybe we should do this once a week. Maybe we can use one slightly higher dose, and let's run a clinical trial. And so this actually made quite a bit of sense, and so we looked at this, and the overall response rate seemed to be similar, but less complete remissions, 
and even a shorter progression-free survival interval. But the trade-off here was uh, uh, no significant neuropathy. And so when you stack up these two schedules, what do we learn? Well, with twice a week, you get better remissions, maybe better you know, control of the disease, shorter time to get somebody into response, actually even a shorter incidence of, of rituxan flare when you give it together. Um, but the trade-off here is that uh, if you use the once a week, you're going to see less neuropathy. And we approach this usually on an individual patient basis. For the patients that have severe disease and need their disease control, like somebody who's coming in with hyperviscosity, you know, you may end up looking at the twice a week schedule, you know, harder than you might the once a week. And for the more indolent patient who's coming in to see you, maybe the once a week actually makes sense. It's just that there are some attributes there that uh, need to be worked out. Now, hope is on the way because there are a whole bunch of new proteasome inhibitors that are now coming down. And usually the example is that when one drug works in a class of drugs, then everybody, many pharmaceuticals, jump on and want to create you know, their version of it that may be actually more effective or have less toxicity. And so the good news to report to you is there are now two new drugs. And the first one I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is carfilzomib. And you should know this drug because it's a drug that should hopefully be approved by the FDA maybe this year um, later this year or early next year in multiple myeloma patients. And what carfilzomib does is it actually targets the same wastebasket, the proteasome, uh, but it does so in a slightly different manner. Now there's also another drug that's also made by Millennium, which is called Millennium 4924. This is a very interesting and rationally designed drug, which actually goes one step before the wastebasket. It actually tries to hit specifically the targets that actually make those proteins, specific proteins, go to the wastebasket in the first place. And so let me tell you a little bit about these two drugs. The first is, look at carfilzomib. When you look at myeloma patients who've got carfilzomib, only about 1% of the patients actually had significant uh, neuropathy. Compare that to bortezomib, you know, in myeloma patients, it's about 10%. And so, at least at face value, it looks like a better drug from a neuropathy point of view. So given these considerations, this is the clinical study that we're going to be opening very soon. We're calling it the CARD study, carfilzomib, rituxan, and dexamethasone. In oncology, we always love to come up with clever acronyms. I remember one time when a very toxic combination was called iced tea, and uh, the IRB said, no, 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 you're going to give the wrong impression to patients. <laughs> but CARD here is a uh, very interesting combination, which we hope will give us what we've seen with um, Velcade-based therapy, but hopefully with less neuropathy. Now, I also alluded to Millennium 4924. This is data that we presented at the ASCO meeting last year. Um, and along with uh, Ken Anderson's group, we've been evaluating this drug in both myeloma as well as Waldenstrom's patients. And what we've learned is that whether it's uh, myeloma or Waldenstrom cells, you can actually kill them quite effectively in the test tube using this uh, drug. And so this is also a study now that has uh, I've gotten approval. We'll be opening this very shortly, giving it with uh, dexamethasone in patients with relapsed and refractory disease. And again, with great fanfare because this drug too, at least in the initial 150 patients that have been treated with myeloma, has shown very little neuropathy. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to end up with very effective drugs against proteasome you know, targets uh, and with less neuropathy, which is what we want. Now, some of you may recognize this slide. Um, you can date yourselves if you want, but this is the Berlin Wall going up, and I think very few things came out of the Cold War except perhaps for one thing, and that was the drug bendamustine. Um, this is an interesting drug because it was developed at the height of the Cold War by East German pharmaceuticals because in the East they just couldn't afford Western medicine, so they put to use their own pharmaceutical uh, concerns to be able to make you know, effective drugs. And it's an interesting drug because it has potentially the activity of a drug like cyclophosphamide built into it, as well as maybe a nucleoside analog. And I have to tell you that this was really the teaching up to now, except last week when I was in Switzerland, we had a, a very high-level advisory board looking at some of these basic mechanisms, only to now re recognize that it probably does not really have that nucleoside analog component uh, that's active. And that's an important consideration because I earlier alluded to the fact that nucleoside analogs may be problematic. So I took a little bit of comfort uh, having heard that uh, at the meeting. Now, Matthias Rummel, 
who is you know, an individual who has played a very large role in the development of new anti-lymphoma therapies in Germany, actually conducted a very large randomized trial looking at bendamustine and rituxan versus chop rituxan in patients with various kinds of lymphomas. And he included Waldenstrom's patients. And this is actually their data showing, in fact, that 40 Waldenstrom's patients included in this large series of over 500 patients had relatively balanced characteristics. Now, this is the data that gets us excited. When you actually see you know, the progression-free survival, which is the time that the disease is kept in check uh, after treatment, look at the numbers for bendamustine and rituxan. At four years, 80% of the patients were still in remission, whereas about 15% of those that got CHOP rituxan were in remission. And so these kind of uh, differences inspire us to look at this drug further. And so given these considerations, we launched a very large uh, a uh, series uh, of patients, uh, a clinical study that went back and looked at a very large series of patients who got bendamustine with relapsed refractory disease. We just published this data, and this was an outcome study looking at 30 patients who were treated with bendamustine-based therapy. And what we saw was that 80% of these patients, most of whom had what we call refractory disease, meaning their disease didn't even remit the first time, actually went on and got a remission. And if you look here, you know, at what happened to their IgM and what happened to their hematocrit, even in this relapsed refractory population, it's quite uh, exciting. Now, early on, I spoke to you a little bit about complete remissions and why we want to get more of them and why it means something to this disease. Of course, I alluded to the fact that you can't get to a cure unless you get a complete remission in the first place, but it also may be a determinant for how long a patient can be kept in remission. And so what you're seeing here is... Uh, from a paper that we just published in the British Journal of Hematology, where we actually took uh, patients with Waldenstrom's that were rituxan-naive, and they got a rituxan-based therapy. And what you can see here is the time that their disease was kept in check. And if you walk yourself right up these different response categories, minor response, partial, very good partial, or CR, you see here that the patients who get the better remission stay in remission longer. And in fact, the goal here is to at least get patients into a very good partial response, which means at least a 90% drop in their IgM from before therapy. And this actually predicts out for a longer you know, time that the patient can stay in remission. Now, you know, how easy is that? Well, you know, it may actually have to do, at least in the case of rituxan, with the genes that the individual patient has. That it has very little to do with the tumor, and it has very little to do with the drug, but it has to do with the genomics. And so let me just expand on some work that we've been involved with, as well as other groups uh, throughout the United States and Europe, that have actually been working on what we call predictive modeling, looking to see, because of the genes that a particular individual has, whether they would respond to rituxan or not. And so as it turns out, there's a very interesting receptor called the FC-gamma R3A receptor, which is found on immune cells. And this is the receptor that actually grabs onto the rituxan that's on a tumor cell. And this is how the immune cells then can feel their way and, and go about destroying the cancer cell to which the rituximab is bound. And so as it turns out, there's a particular position called position 158, where you can inherit, based on what you've inherited from your, your parents, you know, either the amino acid called valine or the amino acid phenylalanine. And about 10% of us only have valine, about 40% of us only have phenylalanine, and about 35% have one of each. Now, valine is a very small amino acid, so the rituxan gets in very nice and tight into that receptor. 